It's very easy. So, good morning, everybody. I hope your morning has gone better than mine so far. Um, we were just getting ready to leave and pull out of the driveway when Andrew threw up all over himself in the van. So I had to drag him out, clean him up, clean the van up. So that's why I'm late and why we are starting late. So I do apologize for that. Your notes are in front of you, lesson 84. And I've been, I searched long and hard, you know, for a good title for these lessons. And I settled on uh, early mid-ax leaders of the 1920s, Harry Boltema. So we're going to be talking about Mr. Boltema today. And, you know, this is one of the interesting things for me at living where we live here in West Michigan, that some of this story about the resurgence of Pauline Truth is local. And it, it, it's based, um, it is, a lot of it is, is based here in events that happened in Michigan and not that far away from us, uh, just down the road in Muskegon. So I want to look at a few things here. Uh, so if you would look at the introduction, it says, one of the men that was pivotal in the establishment of the mid axe movement in the United States was Harry Boltema. In this lesson, we want to consider how Harry Boltema began to understand dispensational truth and as well as how that truth led to uh, excommunication from the Reformed Church. So, thank you. All right, thanks. So we're going to look at some things about, uh, about Mr. Boltema and, and how this happened. So in order to accomplish this task, I want to look at a couple different, three general points. And if we don't make it through all of them today, then we can obviously extend it uh, next, next time. But the three things I want to talk about is just simply who was who was Harry Baltima. Second, I want to look at the, the, the fact that the publication of the, this book, Maranatha, that I have right here, was the thing that caused all the trouble for uh, Harry Baltima with the Reformed Church. And then I want to look at how they kicked him out, his excommunication from the Reformed Church, and how that led to a sort of a renewal of his ministry um, separate from the Reformed Church. So... First, I want to look at Harry, who was Harry Baltimore. So point number one. Harry Baltimore, he was born in 1884, and he was born in Holland, and was one of six siblings who came to America in the early 1900s. He was raised and nurtured by devout parents, and in the United States, studied at Calvin College and Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. After graduation, he pastored Christian Reformed churches in Illinois, Iowa, and Michigan. So he was born in the old country, as it were, in the Netherlands, and his family immigrated to the United States. And when he comes to the United States, he has his story starts with his attending Calvin College and Calvin Seminary here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then he had he serves in three different uh, stints with at three different assemblies within the <coughs> Reformed Church in Illinois, Iowa, and Michigan. Mr. Boltima recounts the early days of his ministry in his autobiography titled "Valiant and Diligent for the Truth: an Autobiography of Harry Boltima." In the foreword, Daniel Baltima, Harry's son, records why his father began writing his autobiography in 1934. As Harry began to record the major events in his life, he began with the following words, quoting now from that. I'm only, I'm only, 50, years, I'm only 50 years and a relatively young man, but I feel death lurking in me, and, and old age and weakness are, are stealing on me. Realizing that the thread of my life might suddenly snap one of these days by uh, considering that my brief life has been much misunderstood. I have a desire that my, that my dear children and my many friends and foes may know the motives and mainsprings of my life. Hence not a vain desire for post-mortem fame, but love for children and for the truth as it is him prompts me to, to pen down these few pages." So that's what he says in his, in, that's what he says about why he's writing this, okay? Um, he, he pretty, he's pretty clear as far as his motives. Daniel Waltema offers the following commentary with regard to his father being misunderstood. Quote, misunderstood. Pastor Waltema alluded to being misunderstood and having many foes during his ministry. The decades of the 1920s and 1930s were especially tumultuous years for my father. In the 1920s, after deep study and much soul searching, he took a stand for premillennial truth. Many friends in western Michigan, as well as in other parts of the country, were moved through the ministry of this truth by my father to, uh, by my father to fresh expectancy of Christ's coming. His further conviction that Christ is the King of Israel, uh, supporting the truth of prophecy, 
and head of the Church of the Body of Christ, supporting the truth of mystery, led to his being forced into leaving the Christian Reformed denomination where he had been reared, trained, and ordained. In the decade of the 1930s, when his deeper studies brought him further insights into, into dispensational truth, he proclaimed the truth of our identification with Christ through the one baptism of Ephesians 4-5. Again, many received this doctrine with the readiness of mind, but others opposed it. So there's, there's the son talking or explaining a little bit more about um, what was going on in his father's life. And Harry Baltima definitely is one of the early pioneers as far as uh, mid-ex dispensationalism in the United States. Finishing that point, now Harry Baltima's intimate friend during his collegiate years was W.B. Erdman Sr., who became the renowned publisher. On July, 19, on July 24, 1912, Baltima married uh, Dean Kuiper, Dean, Dean, I need to check that, I think that should say Deanne, Kuiper, sister of Reverend H. Kuiper, who, <coughs> who assisted in the marriage ceremony. Soon, Baltima was active in his first charge, the First Christian Reformed Church of Peoria, Peoria, Peoria Iowa, where he was ordained and installed on October 18, 1912. He soon established himself not only, not only as a fine preacher and pastor and a strong advocate of missions, but also as a writer for columns in the Pelham newspapers and a force to be reckoned with in the classes. Now, the classes is a Christian Reformed church, uh, word church to describe the structure that, of how that denomination is organized. Okay? They have different uh, local groups, and that's what they call them within that denomination. So Baltimore is becoming a well-respected Bible teacher, writer, his name is getting out there during his first uh, stay here in Iowa, during his stay here in Iowa. Um, he accepted a call to the First Christian Reformed Church in Muskegon, Michigan, and in early 1916, he and his wife and three little girls set out for Michigan. Following his first sermon, Heavenly Treasures and Earthen Vessels, on October, or sorry, April 2nd, 1916, he continued in persistent study and writing, and by April uh, 1917, Baltimore managed to have published his Maranatha. By July of the same year, the second edition of this 400-page volume came out. Both editions were in his native language, Dutch. Nevertheless, the response to his advocacy of premillennialism was dramatic and widespread. So this book right here, Maranatha, this, he writes this book originally in Dutch. Okay, and it's been since translated into English and made available in English. But this is the book that he originally writes in 1917 that is going to start to get him into trouble with the Reformed Church. Okay, he's going to be advocating in this book for dispensational principles. Let me just read to you a couple uh, sections in particular so you get a bit of a, a flavor of what this is. This is from chapter 15, Israel and the Church. He says, when we study prophecy, we must make a distinction between Israel and the Church. Uh, must not ecclesiastical self-knowledge be considered a prerequisite for the practice of godliness? Within the bosom of the church itself, many unscriptural ideas are held concerning its origin, nature, calling, hope, and future. Many believers consider Israel and the church as being essentially the same. Or to be even more precise, all the redeemed are considered together as, as being one class, one body. We are convinced, however, that this idea is not according to Scripture. The Lord does not have one people, but two kinds of people, an earthly and a heavenly people. Israel is his earthly people with an earthly calling. The church is the body of Christ as a heavenly people with a heavenly calling. This distinction was already made symbolically and typically at the calling of Abraham. Then he goes on, at uh, same chapter, he goes on, uh, point number three, he says, Scripture says repeatedly that the church as the body of Christ is a mystery. It is particularly Paul who says this, because to him as the apostle of the Gentiles, the ministry of the mystery was entrusted. In a Pauline sense, a mystery is a truth that can be known in no other way than by special revelation. This mystery was hidden during the preceding ages, was, not known, to, was known to nobody, and was revealed to Paul. It has, it has, sorry, it was known during the old dispensation to, it was known during the old dispensation that someday the salvation of Israel's Messiah would draw, would dawn for all nations. Salvation in the coming Messiah 
would be not only for Israel, but also for the nations. This is abundantly clear. So, he's very clear here in this book about some basic fundamental principles of dispensational truth. And it's the, it's the writing of this book in 1917 that's going to get him into trouble with the Christian Reformed Church. And he basically, he's got chapters in this book about the rapture. He makes a distinction between uh, the coming uh, of the Lord to catch away the saints and the coming of the Lord to back bodily to earth in, in Revelation 19, as well as all sorts of other things. And so the subtitle of the book, A Study of Unfulfilled Prophecy, is what he's basically doing is saying that, look, all these prophecies that remain unfulfilled for the nation of Israel, they've not been transported and put onto the church, the body of Christ. These things have been interrupted and will be finished when God's purpose for the church is complete. And so Baltimore is making these points very clear. So if you look at my second point on page two, Maranatha causes trouble for Baltimore. In his autobiography, Mr. Baltimore recounts the following events from very early in his ministry in Peoria, in Peoria, Iowa. It was perhaps during this pastor's conference that he first began to question the standard views of the Reformed Church with respect to the future of the nation of Israel. Now, so this is his account here from his autobiography of a pastor's meeting that he had, or he was a part of, way back in 1912, 1913, very soon after he took the, his first ministry in Iowa. And he says this in the autobiography. <coughs> Quote, When I was in Peoria, the Reverend Fless was in Pella for at least the first two years. We once had a pastor's conference at the home of his son-in-law, Reverend D. Leo? D. Leo. D. Leo? D. Leo. D. Leo who was married to his eldest daughter. They had asked the old patriarch to give conclusive proof that Israel would be restored. His father, having been a rabbi in Holland, knew Israel's past, present, and future as few others did. And he believed and preached, he believed and preached and taught Israel's future, though always in a general and never in a specific way. I was convinced at the time that God was not all through with Israel as many believed. But I did not know how, why, when, and wherefore. I was greatly interested to hear what our Reverend Father Fless would say on this important theme so close to his own heart. He quietly read the brief chapter of Hosea 3 and said, You all know that Israel was married in covenant to Jehovah, and you all admit that Israel has broken the marriage covenant and committed adultery with other gods. Then he went on how Israel now sits without a God-given king and without a royal prince of their own choice after their own rejection of King Jesus. <clears throat> Hence he said the royal people have no king, neither God-given nor self-chosen. Further, the priestly people have no sacrifice after their rejection of Calvary's perfect land. Neither do they have an image or an idol statue. God cured them from their former idolatry. Finally, brother, and there is a third important reason, he has said the prophetic people have no ephod, this standing metaphorically for the uh, Urim and the, and, and the Tumen, God's revelation, but, ne but neither ha has Israel now any uh, terapim or methods and tokens of false revelation, or, or methods, sorry, and tokens of false revelation. Hence the royal people are without a king, the priestly people without an offering, and the prophetic people without a revelation. This is Israel's present day, desolate orphan period. Ichabod, the glory is all gone. That Israel is lo Amin, not my people, and lo uh, Fahama, is that how you say that? Having no mercy, you all admit as an undeniable fact. Now listen then, brethren, to the word of God in verse 5. He said, afterward, i.e. after this long period of Israel's desolation, which is still going on, the children of Israel shall return and seek Jehovah their God, and shall fear Jehovah and his goodness, when in the latter days the day of Christ's coming and kingdom. After the venerable old man was through, his son-in-law try, uh, tried to tear his presentation all apart. Taking the figure from Kuiper, he exclaimed, Israel is the firehouse, 
And when God has quenched the burning world, then he burns the hose. Fire hose, I'm sorry, not house. My bad. All the other preachers agreed with the reverend, and all agreed that Israel had sinned so terribly that God in his wrath had put Israel forever aside. Christ was the end of Israel, and his church had now fully and finally taken Israel's place in God's plan and counsel. As the youngest, I kept still to the last, but I felt someone somewhat like Elihu, Elihu must have felt in Job 32, 18 through 19. I said, brethren, you have come with sweeping generalizations colored by prejudice and dogma, and you have not even made a fair attempt to answer the logical exegesis of our reverend father Fless. It is not at all to the point what Kuiper, uh, Babnik, uh, and Warfield have said. But the point is what God has said, the, the, what God has said this said this word right here, eloquently brought before us. This exegesis right is right or it is wrong. If the latter, show it conclusively. If it is right, accept it as God's word. Let us as ministers of the word not exalt man's vain reasoning above God's word. They said the exegesis was wrong, but not one made an attempt to prove it wrong. Now, I find this story very interesting on a few levels, okay? Number one, it gives you very, it gives you a lot of insight into the mind and thinking of the Reformed Church and how they view these things, okay? They make, <clears throat> and what Baltimore's doing <clears throat> is he's pointing out here to, to his, being the youngest guy in the room, probably feeling a bit out of place, like he really didn't have a place to say much, he really sort of says, listen, you guys either need to accept what he's saying or prove it to be wrong. Okay? And according to his estimation here, they didn't prove anything to be wrong. Now, if you read Baltimore's autobiography, he makes it seem like, and the, what you would conclude from reading it is that he had already, and he says so in no uncertain terms in the lengthy quote that we just read, that he is already sort of starting to have questions here about the traditional Reformed interpretation of making Israel the church the same and saying that God is completely done with Israel. Now this happens somewhere, I think, in 1912, 1913, and he writes Maranatha in 1917. But this seems to have been a formative event in his thinking um, as he's going to move forward from this point in his ministry. Now, anybody else have any questions, thoughts, or comments about the lengthy quote or anything that we've said about it? Okay. So, since the time... Since the time of the account presented above, Baltimore studied these issues on his own. So from that time until the publication of Maranatha, okay? Thomas Boss Loper, is that how you say that? Boss Looper. Boss Looper, <clears throat> author of Grace and Glory Days, presents the following influences upon Baltimore's thinking and the conclusions that were presented in Maranatha. Quote, Baltimore described how aware he had been of how lacking Calvinistic congregations uh, he had known were of Christian hope. His own study of hope focused on the blessed hope and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this led him to develop a pre-millenarianism, pre-millennial interpretation of, the, of, the great, of this great biblical concept. He too made use of Schofield Reference Bible but had been previously influenced by John Nelson Darby and numerous other theologians who, had who he had meticulously researched. His principal conviction, however, stemmed from his own private reading and study of Scripture. Critical to his interpretation were the following. Uh, critical to his interpretation were the following. Some of this I already read to you from the book. All prophecy in the Old and New Testament must and shall be fulfilled literally. And Israel and the church are two and not one. And Christ is the king of Israel and head of the church. Okay? So, those are the conclusions, those are the core conclusions that you will reach or see if you were to pick up Maranatha, uh, Maranatha and read it. Okay? Now, this puts Baltimore at odds with his denomination. The fact that he accepts this teaching puts him at odds with the Reformed Church. And he's now written the book in Dutch and put it out there in Dutch. One edition in 1917, and then he amends a few things, adds a few things later on, and by the time he's done, it's about a 400-page book. Okay? So, in his autobiography, Baltimore highlights the core principles of Maranatha that landed him in hot water with the Reformed Church. 
Quote, Throughout church history, it is seen that the truth has benefited by error. Even if the two points of Maranatha had been in error, the truth was greatly benefited by them because they caused a wave of new and fresh Bible study. It threw thousands of religious traditionalists out of their ruts and grooves and sent them into a fresh line of Bible study to this, pre to this very day. The two, point, the two points could certainly not be fundamental errors because they were all well substantiated by text from the Word. All admitted that there is an Israel. All admitted that there is a church which is the body of Christ. All admitted that these two are not identical. Again, all conceded that Christ was the King of Israel, and all readily granted that Christ is the head of the church. And all recognized the two concepts of king and head are not exactly identical. Yet my whole Maranatha was practically condemned as a dangerous book because of these two points. Israel and the church are two and not one, and Christ is the king of Israel and the head of the church. Now, you would assume that Boltema knows what he's talking about since he went through a long, lengthy, drawn-out excommunication process where they are kicking him out of the denomination that he knows what they're upset with him about. Uh, so to have his own testimony here I think is very helpful as to what the problems were. Fundamentalists and premillennialists within the sound of his voice and within the range of his writings welcomed him enthusiastically. The brethren in his own denomination in their immediate response lauded him. At the Synod in June 1918, however, Boltema found himself on the agenda. Four overtures had been made to the Synod objecting to Maranatha, from the classes of Zeeland, Holland, Orange City, and Sioux City. By the, conclusion, by the conclusion of the session, the record of the proceedings against him and his views amounted to 200 pages in Dutch. So, he is now the target of the church. And it's interesting, again, you see the localness of this. You see Holland and Zealand are two of the classes that are bringing action against Boltema for what he has to say here in the book. Any questions or comments about any of this? Look, if you go to Holland today, Ernie, you live in Holland, you know this. Anybody that's ever driven through Holland and Zealand, there's like a Reformed church on every corner just about. Okay, and, and it was... Dutch Reformed settlers from Europe that came and, and were largely responsible for settling, you know, Muskegon, Holland, and the Grand Rapids area as far as the history of the country is concerned. And when they came over, they brought with them their Dutch Reformed religion and, and sought to, you know, practice that here in the United States. So all of this is, again, has a, has a localness to it that some of the other stuff that we talked about hasn't. Hey, uh, Henry Hooksema. A rival of Boltemus since seminary was his chief antagonist. Hooksima presented to the Synod with his own uh, to the Synod with his own condemnation of Maranatha. According to Box, what's it, how do you say this? Box Looper. Box Looper. Synod committee reported it had met with Boltema personally for a considerable length of time. But years later, Boltema complained that he was not allowed even five minutes to address the Synod personally. Baltimore offers the following perspective on these proceedings in his autobiography. Quote, I admitted to the uh, synodical, synod, synodical committee that there were many points of unity between Israel and the church. Example, a unity with both in Adam. And I was glad to concede that there were many points of unity between a king and a ruling head. But these brethren, as well as various classical <coughs> brethren, also wanted me to retract the, those two points as falsehood and error. It was simply impossible for me to do it. It would, it, it would have been moral suicide. It would have seared my conscience as with a hot iron. I would have lost the smile of the Lord, he says. I would have grieved his good spirit. I would have lost all self-respect and surely would have given up my ministry as I certainly could not have prayed and preached any uh, in public any longer. So they are they are forcing trying to force him to do what? Recant or retract some of the stuff that he wrote about in Maranatha. And Baltimore says that he couldn't do it. Okay? It's, this whole thing kind of reminds me a lot of Luther standing before the tribunal of the Catholic Church and they're, they're asking him to recant. 
And he says that his conscience is bound to the Word of God, and unless his, unless his teachings be disproved by <coughs> Scripture only, he, he cannot and he will not recant. Um, some of the language that Baltimore uses here kind of reminds me of, of those statements by Luther. So, although, although Baltima contra now this is interesting. Although Baltima contradicted no doctrinal standard of the Reformed tradition, his view apparently contradicted the prevailing biblical interpretation that Israel and the church formed a unity, and that the church is one, is one for time of creation until the time of Christ's second coming. According to Christian Reformed confessions, Christ was to be thought of as king of Israel and king of the church. Baltimore did not view Israel and the church as identical. Fundamentally, the struggle between Baltimore and the, and the Synod was over the question of whether confessions serve to interpret Scripture, which was what their view was, or whether Scripture serve, serve to interpret the confessions. So you have a, you have a fundamental... The fundamental core disagreement here is over what is the authority, okay? Uh, is the Westminster Confession, the Heidelberg Confession, the catechisms of the Reformed Church, are those the authority or is the Word of God the authority, okay? And so the author here, uh, Boss Luper, is, is, is saying that this is the core disagreement. Baltimore is saying that no, the Scripture is the authority and it should interpret whether or not everything is correct in the Confessions. And the, the, the Reformed Church is seemingly taking the opposite position. Okay? So we'll finish this point and then we'll see if there's any questions. Although Harry Baltima wholeheartedly accepted all creeds of Christendom and the doctrinal standards of his Calvinistic heritage in the Christian Reformed Church, he found himself in the summer of 1919 in a precarious position denominationally. He discovered that his denominational papers... The Banner and The Watcher would not publish his articles or statements on the crisis at hand. So, it's, so now he's being censured, okay? They won't print anything that he's writing or anything that he's trying to put out there to defend his position and so on. So in September of 1919, he commenced publishing his own uh, De Bearer. Soon it was being sent to 1,000 homes throughout the country and was said to be read in nearly every state in the U.S. So before we go any further, does anybody have any questions, thoughts? Yes, Mike? Um, I find it kind of ironic that um, Herman Hooksma um, is uh, his chief antagonist because just a few years later, he himself was uh, excommunicated. He's, he's part of the founding members of the Protestant Reformed Church that's um, quite well known in this area. Yeah. It's pretty, keeping track of all the different Reformed groups is like trying to keep track of all the different Baptist groups. There are just so many of them, and they all have their own nuances as far as what their stances are on things. But yeah, I, I thought that was interesting too. And you know, you really see here the, in my opinion, as you look at this, you really see the conflict between the the dispensational viewpoint that Baltimore has embraced, and he's he's refusing to go back on it. And by the time you get to this point where he's publishing his own paper and he feels like nobody, that they're censoring him, it's only a matter of time before they just what? Throw him out. Okay. So any other thoughts, questions, or comments about any of that? Yeah. I remember seeing the banner growing up in my home. You know, my mom and dad always had the banner. And to read the banner, you know, that was like their <laughs> big thing. You know? Did, do you know if they still print that? I think they still oh, absolutely. do. absolutely. Yeah. It's a shadow of his former self. It's Seems like everything is, doesn't it, Mike? A shadow of his former self? <laughs> he, he, even these reform papers... <clears throat> they used to publish Burkhoff's systematic <coughs> theology serially in the banner. And um, now you, you can hardly get a doctrinal article. In the do, you, do you get that magazine? No, but I see it all the time because of where I work. And, okay. Any other thoughts about any of this? Lee, I'm curious, how much of this were you aware, are you aware of just as general knowledge? Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, Dan Bowen, his son, was uh, my first board member. <laughs> and uh, I possess, as so far as I know, I've got a complete collection of anything Dr. 
Walmart so in the world. Uh, I, just a personal opinion, I don't think anywhere in our creation movement you'd find, I think he's the greatest, the very best theologian that the grace movement has ever produced. I mean, this man, I don't know how many books he would read. I mean, he was constantly in the book. Uh, and I know a little bit, of course, Jan Baltimore, her husband is a cousin, yeah. her nephew. So I have some of that, but I've never had, other than, I never met him. You know? Good. So, last point then is excommunication and renewal. <coughs> the cons uh, let's see. How do you consistory. The consistory of the first Christian Reformed Church in Muskegon was called upon by the Synod to act on the matter, this matter relevant to its pastor. Herman Hooksema was one of the members of the three-man committee to present this matter to Baltimore's church. His church, the largest church in Michigan, and the largest church of his denomination, was filled three times every Sunday with 1,500 people. That's crazy. Okay? So this man has a major audience for the propagation of dispensational truth. Okay? And what you see here is even after he writes the book and even after he's getting in trouble, these people are continuing to attend the assembly here. Okay? Um, so where was I? As, as his notoriety spread, he was also elected as chairman of an interdenominational Bible conference, which was to meet monthly. A declaration of 12 beliefs was signed by 17 pastors from the Midwest including two members of the Reformed Church in America. Harry Baltimore's consistory, however, did not act on the recommendation of the Synod. And when the classes of Muskegon convened in Grand Haven, Michigan, on November 11, 1919, it named a committee to ask the consistory to, whatever that is, of Baltimore's church to suspend him as a Christian Reformed pastor. In the event that the consistory did not do so within three weeks, both pastor and cons consistent Consistory. Thank you. would be suspended by, by the classes until the synod met in 1920. Now, the synod's only meeting every two years, okay? By this time, the Baltimore story was in the newspapers throughout West Michigan, and they reported that the 1,500 members of his congregation, the largest church in Muskegon, were behind Baltimore, refused to oust him uh, from his place, and had done nothing whatever towards securing a uh, retraction of his statements. So is he, he's being supported here by the congregation against the uh, would-be actions of the denomination. <clears throat> On December 19, the classes of Grand Rapids, West, and Holland met to take action against Baltimore, unanimously voting to depose him as pastor of First Christian Reformed Church in Muskegon and as a minister of the Christian Reformed Church. His entire, right, what is it? Consistory. Consistory, 16 men, was also deposed. The congregation, however, was not deposed. And former professor Samuel uh, Vol Volbeta, Beta, 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 from Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids was appointed by the classes to occupy Baltimore's pulpit on Sunday, December 21st. So this is all right before Christmas now. Okay. Well, Beta arrived with an entourage at 8.48 a.m., surprised that the service was well underway. Baltimore had begun the worship at 8.35 a.m. The consistory prior to that Sunday morning had voted to have Baltimore preach. Baltimore's text for that morning, uh, Baltimore's text for that morning to a packed church was John 9.34, and they cast him out. <laughs> in the sermon, Baltimore spoke to the issue raised by the Synod that his book, Maranatha, had expressions directly opposed to two fundamental doctrines of the church, the kingship of Christ and the unity of the church of all ages. He made it clear that he was, in fact, and he felt himself to be cast out of the Christian Reformed Church. <clears throat> so he starts, the, the service is supposed to start at 9 a.m., <clears throat> This professor from Calvin Seminary is supposed to be the one that preaches that Sunday morning. And as we're going to see in a minute from Baltimore's testimony that he offers in his autobiography, his board talks him into starting the service early. 
So the service is already underway now when this guy from Calvin Seminary shows up who's supposed to be the guy that delivers the sermon. So let's look at the, the, the Baltimore offers the following account of these events in his autobiography, quote, at the classes meeting where my whole consistency and I were deposed, a sepulchral, sepulchral voice cried out next Sunday, Muskegon, Professor Dr. Uh, Velveta will preach for you. You must all come. My heart, though sick, was fully determined to preach. God had, I was convinced, called me singularly and most surely to Muskegon, and God had not called me away, and I was not a hireling to run away when a few dangers threatened. The next Sunday, I heard the newsboy scream in the streets of Muskegon all about the Baltimore case. Balsama ousted from his pulpit. Will Baltima preach or Velbetta? I have always loathed notoriety and uh, sensational claptrap, and I cannot say what a sickening, paralyzing feeling crept over me when I heard this. Once the inner reassurances of my conscience that I had not sought or made this mess uh, made me calmly go with, so, sorry, calmly go on with determination to preach. I took my text from John 9, and they cast him out. Dr. Veltman, my able assistant, strongly urged, yea, begged me to enter the pulpit five minutes before time. This was not at all my plan, nor my desire, but when they assured me solemnly that serious trouble and scandal might arise if I did not do this, and I looked at the brethren and saw that all ghastly pale with nervousness, then I became convinced that it was with the with that it was the best, and with the great calmness and firmness, I entered the pulpit. When I entered the pulpit, a few people walked out, as I expected. Uh, the Professor Velveta appeared in the back of the church, and he went with the dear folk that walked out to the lower auditorium of the Bethany Church. God gave me grace to speak without malice and with great liberty. So, you know, you, you, and... I read this stuff and I think, man, this is just happening down the road from here, okay? And it's, 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 really, it's really a sort of a thrilling thing to see what, what he's doing here and how he's refusing to, you know, recant and relent, and he's going forward with what, with what he feels to be uh, his conscience according to the Word of God. There's another issue, too, and that's the hierarchy of the church. Yeah. You know, whether it's the local church or these other groups. That seems, that's a great point, Fred, and that seems to not necessarily have been something that was in the forefront of their minds at the time, but that's definitely another issue that is going on here. Who, ha who, who really has the authority here? The denominational structure or the people within the church? If the people within the church still want them to be the pastor, then what right is it of anybody else in the denomination to tell them that he can't be their pastor? So yeah, you're right, that's also an issue here, Ernie. No, I was thinking. What's that? I thought your hand was up. Okay. So, Baltimore reports that the following evening, a group of men met and decided to carry on as if nothing had happened. This, however, was not the case. There immediately arose a legal battle over ownership of the property. Okay? Baltimore's congregation refused to leave the premises, believing the building belonged to them. Taking the position that the property belonged to the denomination, on Saturday, December 27, 1919, a bill of complaint was filed by the classes and congregation of the First Christian uh, and congregation of the First Christian Reformed Church with the state supreme court. So now this is going all the way to the highest court in Michigan, going to decide now who is the rightful possessor of the property of the church. Now that Baltimore is continuing to press forward been kicked out, been removed, been excommunicated, the congregation still wants him, and so now there's going to be a major legal fight that ensues over whose property the building is. Okay? Uh, so, next point. It soon also became apparent that although initially Baltimore's congregation seemed to stand as a unit behind him, there were in fact about 40 families, including two consistory men, that had decided to remain faithful to their denomination. An advertisement appeared in the Muskegon Chronicle announcing a service to be held on December 25th, Christmas Day, at 8.30 a.m. at Bethany Christian Reformed Church, 
for the congregation of First Christian Reformed Church with Pastor Samuel Valvetta preaching. So they're the people that don't want to stay are now going to go and leave, and this guy that had been chosen to preach for him before the Sunday before is going to lead those people in their own service uh, on Christmas Day here, apparently. So finally, on March 31st, 1921, after a lengthy legal battle, so I cut out a lot of stuff here. I didn't want to get into the nitty-gritty details of the, the legal proceedings because I didn't feel they were necessary to, to discuss. You just need to know that it happened and what the outcome was. <coughs> Finally, on March 31st, 1921, after a lengthy legal battle, a report was issued from Lansing that a circuit court decision giving the officers of the Christian Reformed Church in Muskegon custody of the church property was affirmed by the state Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held that while members of the church had a right to withdraw from membership, they had no right to withdraw withdraw from the church any property. After a long struggle, Baltima had finally lost possession of First Christian Reformed Church, but he was not slowed down in his action. On April 4, 1921, the 260 families of the Castile congregation made plans for a new building and parsonage. During the next, this is astounding, during the next four days they accomplished the unbelievable. They built a tabernacle seating 1,000 people at Ionia and Ambrosia Street. And morning services were to be held in the Holland language, and evening services were to be in English. So within four days, the 260 people in this congregation erect a thousand a, a, a tabernacle, a makeshift tabernacle capable of seating 1,000 people so that they could have service the next Sunday. Yeah. That's 260 families. There what were did I say, people? Yeah, people. Okay, I meant the, families. Yeah, because that's how the CRC counts. So that's a lot of people. Okay? And the official, uh, I'm sorry, once again, Baltimore recounts these events in his autobiography. Early in April of the year 1921, when the snow was still on the ground, we had to move out of our building of worship, and we did not know what to do with nearly 300 families. We could not get a church building, a store was far too small, and a theater downtown was for more than one reason not desirable. Hence we decided to build a tabernacle on Ionia Street by the PM Railroad track. A brother from the Christian Reformed Church offered us, his, offered us the ground, and within four days, mind you, they erected a large tabernacle seating a thousand people. Not only all the carpenters of the church, but many outside donated their time and labor freely and gladly. It was a cold winter morning for the first Sunday, but the people, but the people were, a, were warm at heart and served the Lord with gladness. You know, I, I, I read that and I, I'm telling you, and I, maybe you're not going to like what I'm going to say, I don't know that something like this would happen in our modern culture. The fact that you would have this type of camaraderie and spiritual unity within a church, um, and I'm not saying that we don't have that here, but I, what I'm saying is that for these people in four days to build this thing, to have church in the next, and that, that the entire community would then come and help do this, it's just, it's so foreign, I think, to the way we operate now. Yeah. Today there are church splits over the color of carpeting, so I can't even imagine... I mean, it's true, their church is split a lot of times when they do a remodeling job or do make those minor decisions. Yeah. The official name of the new church was changed to the First Berean Reformed Church. To my knowledge, and I don't, so this might be wrong, okay, but to my knowledge, this is the first <laughs> time of a known assembly adopting the use of the term Berean in their name. Okay? Mr. Baltimore explains why that name was chosen. Quote, We reorganized ourselves as the Berean Reformed Church. The name Reform showing that we still clung to all the ancient foundations, while the word Berean, based on Acts 17.11, embodied for my mind more of a uh, scriptural ideal than anything else. We were from the beginning of April to the 1st of January 1922 in our tabernacle on Ionia, which is still standing there today. Now he writes this autobiography in like the 50s. 
Uh, it's probably not there still. I don't. I'm not. I would know. Uh, so let me start over. We were in, we were from the beginning of April to the first of January, 1922, in our tabernacle on Ionia, which is still standing there today. And many people, and I can truly testify that these have been our most happy and joyful days. Between April 1921 and January 1922, Baltimore's congregation purchased property on Delaware and Terrence Street, uh, where they erected a church and parsonage for the grand total of $50,000. On the cornerstone of the church building are the words, built by the grace of God. And on New Year's Day, 1943, the congregation burned the mortgage. Services from Berean Reformed Church were broadcast from the new church on radio station WKBZ. A, fr uh, a Friday night Sunday school lesson at 9.30 p.m. Organ music on Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Morning worship at Sunday morning worship on Sunday mornings at 9.30 and a Holland sermon on Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. In addition, there was an evening service at 7 p.m. The newspaper heralded that the church stands for the book of God, the blood of Calvary, the body of Christ, and the blessed hope of his imminent appearing. Amen. Baltimore said that there are three distinctive features of Berean Reformed Church. First, first of all, it believed in a teaching ministry and a firm stand for the truth for which the Puritans of England and the water beggars of Holland had died. As fundamentalists, we were un unalterably and implacably opposed to modernism in all its phases. Second, the second distinctive feature of the church has been its activity with all its mission programs and various benevolent purposes were not forgotten. The third distinct feature of the Brian church has been the optimistic outlook on the future. Congregations sympathetic to Baltimore were being formed in Grand Rapids, Holland, Grand Haven, and Moline. Christian Reformed preachers in the area were aroused and inspired to preach on Revelation. One newspaper story reported that Reverend Harry, Harry Beats, the, for, uh, the pastor of Burton Heights Christian Reformed Church in Grand Rapids, and one of Baltimore's leading antagonists was beginning a Sunday morning series on Revelation. Baltimore was speaker for innumerable special meetings in churches and missions, and even in tents and pavilions. And he, uh, he was also made a member of the Board of Trustees of Gull Lake Bible Conference. Now, we will have more to say about Mr. Bolton <coughs> in a future lesson, okay? But this is the beginnings. He and a couple men we're going to talk about in the next few weeks are the beginnings of a clear, what's going to become a clear mid-axe movement in the United States. That is going to be distinct from uh, what Bollinger and Welch were teaching. It's going to be distinct from what the, school, the positions of the Schofield Reference Bible was uh, advocating. Yeah. I just did a Google search, and it looks like that church is still in Muskegon, but they're now on Seminole Road. Mm -hmm. so. They still exist. Mm -hmm. I know that. Um, so any, any other questions, thoughts, or comments here about Mr. Baltima? Yeah, Fred. I wonder, was the Maranatha Bible Conference in Muskegon also uh, an offspring from this? I don't, I don't know. I don't. I don't you know do you know, Lee? I, I didn't. I didn't hear that. Maranatha Bible Conference in Muskegon? There's a conference around. Yeah, yeah. Them in Gala Lake that are, have a lot of people. They must have had a similar yeah. origin. I don't know that. No. I, I'll, I don't know for sure, Fred. Yeah, Mike. I have questions about Mr. Baltimore's beginning of the understanding of the beginning of the church. Should we wait on that for your next classes or something? He he distinguished between uh, the body or soma and ecclesia or the church, and therefore he came up with a very different position on the beginning of the church. Yeah, I, I'm I'm sort of the second part of this. I want to cover a few other people. And then in the second part, I want to talk about some of those issues, and then what he, you know, how he became convinced as to the baptism issue, and how that then became the driving force of the major controversy. So I, I if you can wait a few weeks, we'll say a little bit about that in a few weeks. I can throw out a teaser if you want. Um, okay. he, he, start, he starts the church um, <coughs> at the cross. 
which would be more in line with uh, Schofield. What Schofield says in the reference Bible notes on uh, Matthew. So, yeah. And just as a side note, as as we speak right now, we have a man who's taken all of my notes uh, from uh, Bultima's Morning Stars, and I have a complete collection. What they look like. And uh, there you go. <laughs> and there's there's dozens and dozens of those, and he has in there the whole book of Romans, the whole book of Acts. The whole book of Hebrews, and those are all right now being in the process of being transcribed for print. Some and of that as stuff. As I know, those have never ever been reprinted except in that form there. Romans has been, hasn't it? Roman, uh, Romans, Romans has been as a single volume. First Corinthians also. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know whether it's the same as what was yeah, in the not be the Morning same. Stars. So I, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I, again, I, I find it very interesting that all this stuff is happening, you know, right here in this uh, general geographic area here in Michigan. And we're not, a lot more stuff is going to happen here too in, in, in the Grand Rapids area as we continue, you know, forward with, with these studies. So, but the, the main goal here today was to introduce you to this major event and introduce the thinking of, of Mr. Bollinger or not Bollinger, Baltima, as one of the, the, the men that is going to ultimately be one of the early leaders of, of this uh, mid-axe movement that's being formed in the United States. And next week, we're going we're gonna to look at some early stuff about Mr. O'Hare. Yeah. Uh, you might find it interesting in your future. Uh, somebody ought to take a look at the Henry Colt. Uh, Henry Colt was a, a brother he went through a similar kind of a, a trial and battle over the doctrine, and uh, later that became uh, uh, the Ultimate Bible Church. What, what year was that? Uh, uh, possibly within, within my lifetime, so I don't know how long ago. But, uh, but they had a big battle over that. There's a big book out on it. I, I, I don't know if I have it anymore, but I did at one time. I know whether they're, whether they're available. But that was where his struggle was. And then when they built the new Altoona Bible Church. That also had the baptistry in it. And later on, in fact, if you go there, and I've preached there many times, the baptistry is all covered up. It's underneath the platform. But they, uh, they eventually, that became an issue too. And so they did progress in their understanding of the word right and divided. And, I, and you're going to see the same thing with the church there in Muskegon. Church of Muskegon starts off with making it stand on some print, dispensational principles. And then from there, as, Baltimore, as time goes on through the 1920s and early 30s, Baltimore comes to understand some other things from a dispensational point of view, specifically the baptism-related subjects. And then, then eventually they drop the Reformed totally, and they just become the Berean Church or something like that. And so they, they eventually they're going to step away totally from being identified at all as a Reformed Church in name, okay? And even now we see transitions made. When we first came 30-some years ago to Grand Rapids, uh, the Berean Church in Grand Rapids was uh, governmentally uh, a reform. It was a reform system of government. And uh, that's all pretty much changed. For example, a woman could not uh, uh, well, I, uh, Mina DeWitt was our organist, and she could not receive a paycheck because she was a woman, so they had to give their paycheck to Dale. <laughs> and then, of course, when it says wine in the Bible, uh, it meant wine, it didn't mean grape juice. And uh, when they had a church vote, and I think that's still true in the Reformed Church, when they had a church vote, all the women were invited to leave the congregation. They could not, in fact, when we first came, women could not be members of the church. But that's all Christian reform. And so even within our grace environment, it has changed a lot. That's it. And the other thing I'll say to that point, and then we should quit, is that is the fact that this explains, I mean, look, look where Mr. Bolton is coming out of. This explains why in the thinking, even to this day, of a lot of grace thinkers, there's a fundamental underlying Calvinism. Yep. Because a lot of them came out of these Calvinistic churches, and there are some aspects of it that they never relinquished or never, uh, you know, 
change their minds on, or <coughs> however you want to say that. And so that that explains a little bit why there's still this sort of fundamental underlying Calvinistic mindset that a lot of the grace, uh, a lot of the grace men, particularly some of the older ones, um, still have. So anyway, next Sunday we're going to look start looking at some stuff about Mr. O'Hare, and that's uh, that poses its own unique challenges. Because unfortunately, Mr. O'Hare never dated anything he wrote. So it's virtually impossible to lay everything he wrote on the table and read it in order. Because no, and I've, I've, I've asked Grace Bible College, I've asked Green Bible Society, I emailed Pastor Sadler, I've talked to Pastor Jordan, I've talked to anybody I can think to talk to. Does anybody have a chronological listing of the order of O'Hare's words? And nobody has it. So. You're left with trying to piece things together on virtue of internal clues. So we'll start trying to do some of that next time. So, thanks for your attention. Brian? Yeah.